Bibles to the letter to the Romans, uh, the church at Rome. We're going to look, if you'll stand with me, we're going to look at uh, verses 1, uh, chapter, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, chapter 3, verses 21 to 25. You'll see these again as key verses to the, to the letter. You'll be familiar with these. If you're familiar at all with Romans, you'll be familiar with these. Paul says, chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. Fascinating construction there. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And then chapter 3, verses 21 to 25. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And, and I pray that, that you're, as, as my heart has been just strengthened and encouraged reading through this and putting this material together this week, that you will too tonight, having spent time looking into Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Thank you. You may be seated. As you are, I want to read to you again the theme verse that, uh, that really jump-started us. Uh, back some time ago now. We've gone through uh, 39 Old Testament books. We went through an intertestamental period uh, to show you that, that there was things happening in, in that 400 years of silence. And then uh, we have now tackled the Gospels, uh, the acts of the Holy Spirit through the church, and are heading into the letters, the epistles now, uh, until we wrap it up in the Revelation. Here's the verse, two verses, chapter 5, verse 39 and 40 of John's gospel, where Jesus was chiding the religious leaders. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. We, we see that clearly that he would say that to Old Testament scholars uh, today. Though, there are plenty of people who have Bibles who may have read their Bible, had portions of the Bible read to them, and they don't see Jesus. They haven't found eternal life in Him. And so it is still a problem. They may look to the Scriptures to see, how can I have a happy marriage? Uh, how can I get what I want out of life? How can I feel better about myself? We read this morning in Revelation 19, uh, that, the, that the spirit of prophecy is focused on Jesus Christ. The scriptures focus on Jesus Christ. Right, you're going to see this displayed marvelously in Paul's letter to the church at Rome. We're going to take a little time now. That this, there's two videos, so we'll take a little more time than we usually do for Romans. Uh, and so we're going to watch the Bible Project videos on Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Is there a problem? Do we need to delay it? 
There we go. Paul's letter to the Romans. It's one of the longest and most significant things ever written by the man who was formerly known as Saul of Tarsus. He was a Jewish rabbi belonging to a group known as the Pharisees, and he was passionate and devout to the Torah of Moses and the traditions of Israel. And he saw Jesus and his followers as a threat. But then he had a radical encounter with the risen Jesus, who commissioned him as an apostle, like an official representative, to the world of non-Jewish people called Gentiles in the Bible. And so he started going by his Roman name, Paul, and he traveled all around the ancient Roman Empire telling people about the risen King Jesus and forming his followers then into these new communities called churches. And Paul would occasionally write letters to these new Jesus communities to help them foster their faith or answer questions, and the book of Romans is one of these. It was actually written quite late in his career. Now we know from the book of Acts that the church in Rome had existed for some time, that it was made up of Jewish and non-Jewish followers of Jesus. But at one point the Roman emperor Claudius had expelled all of the Jewish people from Rome. And then about five years later all of those Jews, including Jesus following Jews, were allowed to return. And when they did they found a church that had become very non-Jewish in custom and practice. And so this created lots of tension. So that by Paul's day the Roman church was divided. People disagreed about how to follow Jesus. They were debating about whether non-Jewish Christians should celebrate the Sabbath or eat kosher or be circumcised. And so Paul wrote this letter to accomplish a few things. He wanted this divided church to become unified and for a practical purpose. He was hoping that the Roman church could become a staging ground for his mission to go even further west all the way to Spain. And so these circumstances are what motivated Paul to write out his fullest explanation of the gospel, the good news that he was announcing about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Now the letter is designed to have four main movements, but it's unified as one long flowing exploration of the gospel. The gospel, Paul says, first of all reveals God's righteousness, and then it also creates a new humanity which fulfills God's promise to Israel. And so it's this gospel that's going to unify the church. In this video we're just going to explore the ideas in chapters 1 through 4. So Paul opens by introducing himself as an apostle appointed by God to spread the gospel about Jesus, how he's the Messiah of Israel who was raised from the dead as the Son of God, King of the nations. And Jesus now calls all humanity to come under his loving rule. And Paul says this good news about King Jesus is first of all God's power to save people who trust in him, and second that it reveals God's righteousness. Now. Righteousness is a rich Old Testament word for Paul. It describes God's character, that he always does justice, what is right and what is good, but also that he is faithful and just to fulfill his promises. And Paul's saying that the story of Jesus shows how God has done both of these things. How? Well, he goes first into a long creative retelling of Genesis chapters 3 through 11. He shows how all the Gentile world, all the nations, have become trapped in the spiral of sin and selfishness. The human heart and mind are broken, Paul says. We've turned away from God to embrace idolatry, which means finding ultimate significance in created things and then giving ultimate allegiance to these things that are not God. This results in a distortion of our humanity and destructive behavior. And so what's left is a humanity that stands guilty as charged before a just and righteous God. To which the people of Israel might say, well, it's a good thing then that God chose our people out from among the nations. He saved us out of slavery in Egypt. He gave us the laws of the Torah like the Sabbath and eating kosher and circumcision. And these all together show us how to live as God's holy people. But, Paul says, not so fast. He recalls the storyline of the Torah and of the rest of the Old Testament which shows that Israel was just as sinful and idolatrous and morally broken as the rest of humanity. Israel is actually more guilty than the Gentiles, Paul says, because they have the Torah. They should know better. And so, Paul concludes, all humanity, Gentiles, Israelites, are hopelessly trapped and guilty before God. But that is not the final word. The good news about Jesus is God's response. Instead of holding humanity guilty, Jesus came as Israel's Messiah to die on behalf of all people as a sacrifice for sins. As our representative, Jesus took into himself all of the just consequences of the pain, the sin, and the death 
that we have caused in the world. And he overcame it all by his resurrection from the dead. It's his new resurrection life that he makes available to others. Jesus became what we are so that we might become what he is. And all of this, Paul says, is how God justifies those who trust or have faith in Jesus. Now, justification is another rich Old Testament term for Paul, and it's related to God's righteousness. It literally means to declare righteous. Because of what Jesus did on our behalf, we are given a new status before God. Instead of finding us guilty, God declares that a person is in a right relationship with him and is forgiven. Justification results in a new family. The person who trusts in Jesus is given a place among God's covenant people. Justification also results in a new future, which begins a journey of life transformation by God's grace. And so all of these things about justification are God's gift to those who through their faith are in Christ. And so this leads Paul in chapter 4 to explore the huge implications that all of this has for who can be a part of God's covenant family. He goes back to the story of Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. Before any of the laws of the Torah were given to Israel, Abraham was justified or declared righteous before God. How? Well, God promised that Abraham would become a father of a large multi-ethnic family that would receive God's blessing. But he and his wife Sarah, they were really old. They had never been able to have children. But nonetheless, Abraham had radical faith and trust in God's promise. And so God declared him to be righteous. And so Paul says, now Abraham has become the father of God's new covenant family. And it's spreading all around the world. It's made up of Jews and Gentiles who have the same kind of faith and trust in the one who fulfilled God's promise to Abraham, Jesus the Messiah. So let's pause and summarize Paul's main ideas here in chapters 1 through 4 because they're the foundation for understanding the rest of the letter. All humanity is hopelessly trapped in sin and needs to be rescued. That rescue, however, is not going to happen by people trying to obey the laws of the Torah. Rather, God's righteous character has moved him to rescue the world through Jesus' death and resurrection so that... He could create that multi-ethnic family of Abraham based on faith as his own new covenant people. And so Paul's going to go on to show how this new family is a part of something much, much bigger that calls them to a whole new way of life together. But it's all going to be rooted in these core ideas explored in chapters 1 through 4 of Paul's letter to the Romans. Paul's letter to the Romans. Check out the first video where we explored who Paul was and why he wrote this letter and where we trace the core ideas of chapters 1 through 4. That all humanity is hopelessly trapped in sin and needs to be rescued. That this rescue is not going to happen by people trying to obey the laws of the Torah. Rather, God's righteous character has moved him to rescue the world through Jesus' death and resurrection so that he could create a faith-based multi-ethnic family of Abraham as his people. Now, in the remaining three movements of the letter to the Romans, Paul is going to develop these ideas even more. So, remember, Paul's exploration of justification by faith, that when people trust Jesus' death and resurrection was for them, they're given a new status, they're right with God, they're placed in a new family, the covenant people of Abraham, and they're given a new future, the hope of a transformed life. Now Paul wants to show how this reality should reshape every part of our existence because being in this family means being a part of a new humanity that God is creating through Jesus and the Spirit. So Paul goes back to the first human character of the biblical story, Adam. His name means humanity. And Adam, like all humanity after him, has chosen sin and selfishness. And so everyone faces God's judgment because we've become slaves to sin's influence resulting in death. But then Paul contrasts Adam with Jesus, who he says is the new Adam, a human who lived in faithful obedience to God, shown through his act of sacrificial love. And now Jesus offers his life as a gift to others so that they can be justified before God. And so Jesus stands as the head of a new humanity that is being transformed by this gift, which leads him to chapter 6. Paul reminds these Christians in Rome that choosing to follow Jesus means leaving their old Adam-like humanity and entering into the new Jesus-like humanity. 
and their baptism was a sacred symbol of that transition. Their old humanity died with Jesus, and their new humanity was raised with him from the dead. So when a person trusts in Jesus, their life becomes joined to his life. What's true of him is now true of them. It's when people accept their identity as Jesus-like humans that they are liberated to become the wholehearted humans who can truly love God and their neighbor. Now, if creating this new humanity was always God's purpose, Paul asks in chapter 7, what then was the point of God giving Israel the law, or in Hebrew, the Torah? Now, side note, when Paul uses this word law, he sometimes means the storyline and message of the first five books of the Bible, but other times he's more specifically referring to the hundreds of commands given through Moses and that are found in the Torah. The second meaning is Paul's focus here. What was the purpose of all those commands? Paul says that the commands of the Torah were good. They showed God's will for how Israel was to live. But if you read the storyline of the Torah, Israel broke all those commands. The more laws Israel received, the more they replayed the sin of Adam and rebelled. So even when God gave his people specific moral rules to obey, that did not fix the problem of the sinful human heart. And so paradoxically, these rules made Israel even more guilty. But, Paul says, that paradox is the point. God's goal was to make it crystal clear that it's evil that's hijacked the human heart and that the Torah, good as it is, could not do a thing about it. But, Paul says in chapter 8, the solution has arrived in Jesus and the Spirit. And here's how. The commands of the Torah acted like a magnifying glass. It focused the problem of the human condition into one place, the people of Israel. But now Israel's representative, Jesus the Messiah, has paid for and dealt with all of that sin through his death and his resurrection. And now Jesus has released his spirit into his new family to transform their hearts so that they can truly fulfill the call of all the Torah's commands to love God and neighbor. And there's more. God's renewal of human beings is the first step of his larger mission to rescue and renew all of creation, making it a place where his love gets the final word. Now you can see how chapters 1 through 8 are one long flow of thought here, but it raises some other questions. If all of this was God's purpose, what is the current status then of Paul's fellow Israelites who don't acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah? How does this story fulfill God's promises to them? Well, Paul begins in chapter 9 with his own anguish over fellow Israelites who don't think Jesus is their Messiah. And it leads him to reflect on Israel in the past from the Old Testament story. And he reminds us that simply being an ethnic Israelite, a physical descendant of Abraham, never made one automatically a faithful member of the covenant family. Paul shows us how God has always selected a subset from Abraham's family to carry on the line of promise. And his point is that now that line of promise is carried on by those who follow Jesus. He reminds us that for a long time, people inside and outside Abraham's family have rejected God's will. He reminds us of the story of Israel and the golden calf and of Pharaoh's rebellion. He shows us how God was able to orchestrate events so that people's rejection of him actually accomplished his redemptive purposes. And so in chapter 10, Paul turns his focus to Israel in the present. The reason many Israelites reject Jesus is because they're basing their covenant relationship with God on their performance of the commands in the Torah. And so sadly, they don't recognize what God has done through Jesus to create a new covenant family on the basis of faith. And so Paul asks in chapter 11, what is Israel's future? Has God written off his people? No, he says. There are tons of Jewish people, including himself, who do recognize Jesus as their Messiah, but there are also a lot who don't. But God has been able to use their rejection for his own purposes. It's caused the gospel to spread even quicker and farther into the Gentile world, making the family of Abraham even larger and more multi-ethnic. Paul describes God's covenant family as a big olive tree, and the rejectors of Jesus have been broken off, so to speak, and these Gentiles are like wild branches that have been grafted into the family tree. However, Paul says, one day Jesus will be acknowledged by his own people. He doesn't offer any details about how. Paul simply trusts God's character and promise that he won't give up on his covenant people.
which transitions into the final section of the book, chapters 12 through 16. But remember the big picture. Because of their faith in Jesus, Jews and Gentiles are now together Abraham's family, that new humanity that's being transformed by God's Spirit. And so this is how God's fulfilling his ancient promises. Therefore, the only reasonable response is for these Jews and non-Jewish Christians to be unified as the church. In chapters 12 to 13, he shows that this unity will come from a commitment to love and forgive each other. Love will look like everybody using their diverse gifts and talents to serve one another in the church. And it will also mean humility and forgiveness. When these different ethnic groups and cultures come together in Jesus, conflict is inevitable, and it can only be overcome through the hard work of forgiveness and reconciliation. This is how they will show the greatest of Christian virtues, love, which fulfills the Torah's greatest commands to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. In chapters 14 and 15, he focuses specifically on the issues that are creating ethnic divisions in the Roman church. These are disputes about the Jewish food laws and the Sabbath. And Paul says these practices don't define who's in or out of Jesus' family. And if people differ over these culturally important but non-essential issues, they need to learn how to respect each other's differences. And it's in this way that love will heal and unify Jesus' family. Paul closes the letter by first commending Phoebe, who's a key leader in the church of Cenchrae. She had the honor of carrying and perhaps even reading this letter aloud to the Roman churches for the first time. Paul then concludes by greeting all the people that he hasn't seen for a long time, and that's the end. Whoa. You can see better now how all the pieces of this letter fit together and show what a profound masterpiece it truly is. That's what the letter to the Romans is all about. That's a pretty good summary of Romans. Uh, I might take issue with him on some, a few things. I would, in some of the things, I think he put the emphasis on the wrong syllable, but by and large, it's a, it's a very helpful panoramic overview of Romans. So one writer has said that Paul's letter to the Romans is a magnum opus. It is his, it's his greatest achievement. And it's placed first among the 13 epistles in the New Testament. Uh, and it's distinguished from the Gospels and the Acts in this way. The four Gospels present the words and works of Jesus Christ, what we both began to do and to teach. Remember Luke talked about that. Romans explores the significance of his sacrificial death. Romans is, one fellow said, Paul's, uh, it's the Gospel of Paul. He's not been to Rome. I would differ a little bit in terms of uh, some of the things he said about writing to Rome. He's never been to Rome. He wants to go to Rome. You'll see in a little bit that this letter was written from Corinth probably. And so he writes to the church at Rome, a church that he did not found, did not establish. He writes basically what he taught anywhere else he went to establish a beachhead for the gospel. He uses a question and answer format. You will say to me, and he asks questions. I believe that he's asking questions, not so much that have come to him from Rome, but he's asking questions that he himself had to face when he had his life turned upside down on the Damascus Road and then was taken off into the, into the Arabian Desert by the Holy Spirit and schooled in the gospel. This letter to the Romans is the most systematic presentation of doctrine in the Bible. But it's more than a book of theology. Chapters 1 through 11 give us great doctrinal treatment. Chapters 12 through 16, as you just saw in the, in the video, uh, speaks about practical living. Uh, this is how you're saved. This is how people, how saved people live or saved people behave. We'll see that. The good news of Jesus Christ is certainly a message to be received, but it's also a life to be lived 
the best evidence that we have received the gospel is not our capacity to recite it. The best evidence we've received the gospel is a life transformed by it. It's a life to be lived, a life of righteousness that would reflect that we have been justified freely as chapter 3 verse 24 that we read earlier, justified freely. The word freely there is justified without initiating cause. God doesn't look in us. He did not do it in eternity past. He does not do it in time and space. He does not look in us and see in us anything worthy of being rescued or reconciled. He, he justifies us. He declares us not guilty before him and accepts us as righteous in his sight without any initiating cause in us. By mere grace, honoring the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if we do a little outline survey of Romans real quickly, as I said, it was written from Corinth around 57 AD. Jesus rose from the grave and, and ascended on high 30, 33, 27, 30, 33 AD, depending on the, whose timeline you're following. The first major section is the revelation of the righteousness of God. Chapter one, verse one through the end of chapter 8. Let's read those opening verses. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, chapter 1, verse 1 here, called, summoned to be an apostle. He was summoned on the Damascus Road. Uh, didn't take a whole lot of convincing after God got hold of him. Set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son. This is, this is an incredible admission by someone who, when, when, when converted and commissioned, was on his way to kill those who were identifying as followers of Jesus, who had said he was the Son of God, who was descended from David according to the flesh, was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness. You see the Trinitarian emphasis there? God, the Son of God, the Holy Spirit, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship. Remember we've talked about this word apostleship, apostolos. It means sent one through whom I have been saved and by whom I have been sent, is what he's saying here. To bring about the obedience of faith. Uh, there, <clears throat> the construction there is, is the obedience that is the fruit of faith. We sing a, sing a hymn, trust and obey, for there's no other way. You don't get that out of order. It's, if it's obey and trust, it's out of order. It's not a gospel song, it doesn't, doesn't pertain to the gospel. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. The obedience of faith. When true faith comes, one of the markers is obedience for its, for its fruit. For the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Christ Jesus, writing to, to a Gentile church, primarily Gentile church in Rome, to all those in Rome who are loved by God, called to be saints, grace to you, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this, he is going to go on and talk about this revelation of righteousness. This, this section, chapter 1, 1 through 839, covers the issues of sin, salvation, and sanctification. When you break it down, the need for God's righteousness in chapter 1, 1 through chapter 320 is because of sin, the universality of sin. When you read this letter, I don't know how familiar you are with it, Paul is really going after the Gentiles initially. And you can imagine the Jewish Christian sitting in the church at Rome going, yeah, that's right. Well, I'll tell you, you Gentiles are a bad, bad lot. And then he turns it and says, do you think you're any different? You who had all the privileges, the promises, the covenants? No. And then he says, God holds all guilty. All have sinned. 
And so what you have, if, you, if we could diagram it out, if we had the time tonight, and I've got to be real careful because this, this, I'm passionate about this, this book, is you have this chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. The righteousness of God is revealed. But when you read verse 18, he says the wrath of God is being revealed. And what you learn is that the gospel is a double-edged sword. It is good news for people who need good news. It is bad news for people who yawn at good news. The wrath of God is being revealed. And he goes on and talks about how people suppress the truth. He talks about how in that section how God has implanted. Ecclesiastes says he's placed eternity in our hearts. God has implanted in the soul of every person. Deep down, they may have covered it over. They may have tried to harden it, wash it out. Deep down in the soul of every person is the reality that there is a God, there is a creator. And they try to suppress the truth in unrighteousness and all sorts of wickedness and wantonness, and perversion. Think about the things that people do. And if you, if you boil it down, what is it? Why do people drink themselves stupid? Why do people get strung out on drugs? Why do people engage in all sorts of sexual immorality? Why do people uh, engage in lifestyles that, that are immoral and thievery and, 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 and killing and maiming? Why do people embrace uh, the, the LGBTQ P now? You can add P to that, uh, the pedophilia that's now raised its ugly head. Uh, the LGBTQ P plus. Uh, why do they? They're suppressing the truth that they are accountable to their creator. That's all it is. And they encounter, well, this is fun and I want to be free and... No, it's, 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 you know it's not freedom. It's, it's, it's bondage of the worst type. So Paul talks about that. That there's this need for God's righteousness. And so he says in chapter 3, verse 20, if you, if you understand what he's doing, he kind of breaks away. In fact, I'm going to read this to you so that you can see, uh, see what he's done here. In chapter 3, verse 20, Verse 19, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. He's saying right there that the whole world is under the law. They may not, may not have seen it written on tablets of stone. They may not have had it taught by the rabbis, but there is on the conscience of every son of Adam, every daughter of Eve, a shattered moral law that holds the conscience guilty. For by, the, by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. This is a stinging rebuke to Jewish people who, are, who become Christians in that congregation. Since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. That's what the tool of the law was for. In fact, when you read Galatians, it was, the law was never given that a person might be justified by it. Because as soon as it was given, it was sinned against. Adam and Eve had... Uh, in, their, in their conscience capacity, full use of their minds, they understood moral law. It didn't have to be written down on stone. These were creatures made in the image of God who were made upright. Moses goes up to Mount Sinai to receive the tablets of stone. Before he can get down, the people are, are manufacturing a golden calf. It's, the law was never given as a place, now do this and do this and do this and you'll be right and right with God. No, the law was given saying, do this, do this, do this, and you face the reality that I cannot do this. And by the law comes the knowledge of sin, the sinfulness of sin. Okay, now I want to back up now a minute. Just read chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it... The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Jump over to chapter 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. He's, con he's continuing his thought there. Chapter 118 through chapter 320 was, was sort of a, a, a uh, moving away to explain that the gospel is not only about the righteousness of God, it's about the wrath of God. So I just wanted you to see that. So he picks up his train of thought there. And so that bring, brings us to, if sin made 
God's righteousness, the necessity, then justification is the demonstration, it's the remedy for sin, the demonstration of God's righteousness. Chapter 3, verse 21 through chapter 5, verse 20, where he goes through, as was sketched out on the video, uh, where he's talking about how uh, the Lord sets Jesus forth as a propitiation. How does a, how does a holy God, who is absolutely holy, totally righteous, never, never uh, does anything against his character to contradict his being, how does he forgive sinners? You and I would have never thought of it. He does it this way. Paul says it in Romans 3. He maintains his justice by setting Jesus Christ forth as a propitiation. The pro word propitiation, big word, propitiation, five-syllable word. It means the, the sin-bearing, wrath-appeasing sacrifice. In the sacrificial system, they would propitiate. They would sacrifice an animal, and by doing so, through, in, their, in their symbolic format, have the, have the assurance that they had the smile of God. That's why they would travel at great inconvenience and great cost to Passover every year. Now, there was a symbol. It wasn't the substance. God sets forth Jesus to be the propitiation for sin. He offers the sacrifice himself so that he may be, Paul says in here, just, he's maintaining his justice, and at the same time justify the ungodly through, through the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so this is, this is justification, the glory of justification. And Paul talks about that in chapter 4 and chapter 5. And then he shifts to chapter 6, 1, about sanctification. Sanctification uh, is the, the manifestation of God's righteousness. If, if justification demonstrates it, Sanctification manifested that it's effectual uh, in some of our confessions. I think it's the New Hampshire. It speaks of justification and, and sanctification as twin, twin graces. That you never see justification without sanctification. And you never see real sanctification without justification. And if you think about it, you know people, you've known them through the years, who, will, who they won't use the words justification, sanctification, but they'll say, well, I'm saved. But they're living, like, they're living like a bat out of Hades. They're living like people that don't ever think a thing about God, like they can make it up as they go. No, there's no sanctification there. If there's no sanctification, there's not any real justification. And if there's not real justification, guess what? Their sanctification is simply made up of their own, their own rules. <laughs> so these are, these are realities. And I've told you, we'll look at this in a moment, but I've told you before, you see salvation in three tenses. Justification, I, I have been saved from the penalty of sin. Sanctification, I am being, it's ongoing, I am being saved uh, from the power of sin. Some of our, some of our charismatic uh, folks teach an instantaneous, once for all, sanctification, perfection. That's not right. If that's, if that's right, you need to cut Romans 7 out of the Bible. No, it's a progressive. I have been saved from the penalty, justification. I am being saved from the power, sanctification. I shall be saved from the presence, glorification. We'll see that again in a moment. And so then there is the vindication of the righteousness of God in chapter 9, 1 through eleven thirty-six. 36. I, I, I see this passage a little differently than the, than the video does. Uh, this, if you want to look at 9 with me real quick, imagine yourself trained all of your life, trained effectively, you received Judaism at a level that very few did. You were looked upon as an expert in Judaism. So much so that when it came time to put down this rebellious sect that had the, had the audacity to take the name of God, to, have a, to follow a, a rabbi that didn't come out of their schools who claimed to be the son of God, this was the man that was tasked to stop it. He was articulate. He was committed. Now imagine being that person. Your whole life's been invested. Your parents had you trained by the best rabbis. You grew up being trained by the best rabbis. Your whole life's invested in, in promoting and defending Judaism, the honor of God. And on the Damascus Road, you encounter an experience that totally 
wrecks your world. What do you do? Look at Romans 9. After he starts out in chapter 9, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience is bearing witness with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Why would he have sorrow and unceasing anguish in his heart? For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ. I would be willing to go to hell, Paul says, for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, my fellow Jewish friends, whom not that long ago, a few years ago now, several years ago, I was at lockstep with them. I was their hero. I was their champion. You know, if you read the book of Acts, that after he confessed faith in Christ, there was a group of his friends who swore an oath not to eat again until they had Paul's head on a platter. They're Israelites, and to them belong the adoption. These are the privileges he mentions in chapter 3. The adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ. Christ himself is a Jew who is God over all, blessed forever. Here's his dilemma right here in this next verse. This is what Romans 9, 10, 11 is about. But it's not as though the word of God has failed. That's a conclusion you could easily come to, that all that you've studied, all you studied in the Old Testament, missed it. How could I have spent my life studying the Old Testament and then been convinced that going after and he was alive when Jesus was crucified. Going after the followers of, of the way, the followers of Jesus, was something that would please God. How could I miss it that much? And this was, this was a real dilemma for Paul. It's not as though the word of God had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not all who, who have the, the fleshly uh, genealogy. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. That is his, his uh, physiological, genetic, genealogical offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. If you know Romans 9, it's a fascinating study where Abraham and Sarah, promised by God in, in the covenant to have a multitudinous uh, family she couldn't bear, she said, take Hagar, my concubine, she'll be my representative. He does. Ishmael is conceived and, and, and birthed. And that's not the answer. They took God's plan in their own hands, didn't trust in God with this. Caused great, great consternation. So, Abraham and Sarah themselves conceive and she bears a son Isaac so they had this Ishmael that they had on their terms and they had Isaac they had on God's terms through Isaac shall your offspring be named not Ishmael the firstborn through a concubine so he's having to work through this it means that it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise. And he goes on down. And I don't have time to develop this tonight, but this is, Romans 9 is a fascinating study because people, he's arguing for people who are going to say, wait a minute, Paul, that's two different women. He says, okay. What about Isaac? His wife. She conceives twins. Jacob and Esau. They're told... The older shall serve the younger. That's totally out of, out of step with Jewish uh, genealogy. The older one gets the, he gets the birthright. He, the family name is in him. And you know the story about how the elder, uh, anyway, just the, the way the birth took place. And Esau is rejected. Isaac is, a, is affirmed. I mean, pardon, Jacob. Jacob is affirmed. Esau is rejected. And so what he's teaching here, though, just real quickly, is God's distinguishing sovereign choice. And that's, that's where Paul had to come. That this wasn't going to happen. It was never going to happen. 
by birth. It was going to happen by sovereign choice. And he says this as he goes down and says that God's purpose according to election might stand. Not of him who wills, him who runs, but of God who has mercy. So, so you have to read Romans 9 the right way, which respectfully I will say our friends on the video do not. And I think they've missed some things. But this idea of the, the, the vindication of the righteousness of God, this is Paul's dilemma. Did, did God blow it? Did we blow it? Did we never understand it? No. He says, it's not as though God's plan had failed. That's critical. It's not as though God's plan had failed. God's plan unfolded just as he intended for it to. It's just that we Jews didn't see it. So Israel's past and the election of God, Israel's present and the rejection of God, Israel's future and the restoration by God. You have to be careful how you use Israel. Will Will, quote, all Israel be saved? I pray to God they will. I pray the day comes when, when every Jew in, in Israel, every Jew scattered across the world in Russia and wherever comes to faith in Christ. But that is not the promise here. Every one who is spiritual Israel will be saved. The same promise Jesus said, I will not lose one that the Father's given me. So you have, to, you have to tweak the way you read and understand this. And then, then you have the application of the righteousness of God. In other words, the gospel is not just a good idea. It's not just good news. It's not, it's not heavenly life insurance. It's not eternal fire insurance. It, it, is, it is transforming. It's a transforming message that all who receive it are transformed. And so you have this, uh, the behavioral aspect. Christian duties. Chapter 12, verse 1, if you remember how it starts, after he's gone through all these great doctrinal treatises in chapters 1 through chapter 11. As my professor Curtis Vaughn said, when you get to chapter 11, in chapter 11, you're standing on Mount Everest. You're looking over every other truth, every other precipice in the New Testament when you're standing on 9, 10, and 11. He says then in chapter 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, in view of God's mercies. What's, what is he, how does he sum up what he's done in chapter 1, 1 through chapter 11, 36? God's mercies. <laughs> That's his one line description. I beseech you in view of God's mercies that you uh, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Stop being conformed to the world. Keep on being transformed. We've talked about that before. Metamorphosis from the inside out. So he appeals to the doctrinal realities to show that those embraced in, in head and heart are transformative. And then he talks about how to live. Christian duties, Christian liberties, of course, the issues that came up there. So that's, um, that's not a brief outline. But that's, we, need, we need to cover that, okay? Now I'm going to have to start. I've got to, I have to move like Jehu through the streets of Jerusalem here now. So I'm going to start determining what I need to leave out. The poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge regarded Romans as the most profound book in existence. The commentator Godet called it the cathedral of the Christian faith. Martin Luther said this epistle is the chief part of the New Testament and the very purest gospel. It can never be read or pondered too much, and the more it is dealt with, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. Now what I'm going to do, since I dug down a little deeper than my sketchy outline, suggested I should is hit some highlights here in the more in the paragraph outline righteousness speaks of per perfect conformity to an unchanging standard God's righteousness doesn't change I don't care how the winds blow in the beginning God made them male and female and he hadn't he doesn't have a plan B marriage is to be among one one man one woman in one flesh union for all of life no plan B. The sinner who trusts in Christ receives the righteousness of God. He's declared not guilty, treated as if he'd never sinned in his position before God. Faith is the instrumentality for salvation and a gracious gift of God. It's the conduit, if you please. God's grace is poured through the conduit of faith, and we receive the gospel. Salvation. A believer saved from the penalty of sin, the past, the power of sin, the present, and the presence of sin, the future. It's another way of looking at what we said a while ago. 
words that are used in, in, in here, justification, I told you that's a judicial term. It means that the believer in Christ is declared righteous by the holy God. The Lord is not unjust when he justifies sinners because he bases his pronouncement of justified upon the death of Christ in behalf of others. Redemption, uh, through the death of Christ, Christ has paid the ransom price of sin by purchasing. That's what the word redemption means. It means to purchase believers out of slavery. It's a marketplace term. And setting them free from the penalty of sin. Propitiation, I talked about that. It satisfies the demands of, of the righteous God who cannot overlook sin. It appeared for a season he had, who had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished in, in Romans 3.25. It appeared that he had, but he never had. Jesus Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. As surely as the plan was, was engaged in eternity past, it was going to be accomplished. So God never did overlook one sin, never has, never will. Every sin, think about this, every sin you've ever committed, every sin anyone you know has ever committed, ever will be committed, has either been punished in Jesus Christ or will be punished in that person. No sins get a pass. Okay. about the introduction and title of Romans? The reason it's first among the, the letters, we believe, is because it is so great. It sets the tone for the rest of the New Testament, certainly for the rest of his letters. There's a title to it that's found called Pros Romaios to the Romans. It's been associated with this letter from the beginning, so there's not a lot of disputation that this letter was written to the church at Rome. As far as the author goes, Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Christ, there's really no, no disputation among scholars either that this is written by Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus before his conversion. There's, there's problems when you get to the end of the book. We won't go into a lot of detail here, but, but it seems like when he starts naming off, I think, these 26 people in chapter 6, greet so-and-so, greet so-and-so, there's people say, well, how, how does he know so many people when he's never been there? There's no clear answer to that, unless you could say that he took an inordinate interest in the church at Rome. The population of Rome at the time of this writing was somewhere between, depending on who you believe, one and four million people. It was the largest city in the known world. It was a key uh, foothold for the gospel. And so Paul seems to have had a, a, an interest and a desire to travel there. Probably Peter did not found the church at Rome, Roman Catholicism notwithstanding. Uh, some have suggested Aquila and Priscilla may have when they left uh, after Pentecost, that they may have gone back uh, and, and started the church. Perhaps some have suggested that, that some of Paul's uh, disciples that he trained went, which may, which may uh, account for his familiarity. Rome was a place where they had a lot of house churches. When you read chapter 16, greet so-and-so in the church that meets at their house. Greet so-and-so in the church that meets at their house. In that list of, of names, we won't have time to go over tonight, you have aristocracy, you have slave names, you have Jewish names, you have Gentile names. It was quite a, a, a multi-ethnic, uh, multi-economic uh, status church. And they had several house churches. When he starts greeting them, that's what he's doing. As far as the date goes, uh, it appears that Paul wrote Romans uh, in 57 AD near the end of his third missionary journey. And you can check these things out if you want to jot those, those uh, accounts down. Apparently written during a three-month stay uh, in the area of Greece, specifically Corinth. He was staying with Gaius of Corinth. He mentions someone called Erastus. This helps you with historical identity here. The treasure of the city, and we know from a first century inscription in Corinth that Erastus, the commissioner of the public works, laid this pavement at his own expense. So, so there's, a, there's a historical figure uh, outside of Scripture who, who identifies with Paul's uh, citation. He'd apparently finished the collection uh, from the churches of Macedonia and Achaia. Of course, this, was all, this collection was for the 
uh, difficult times the Christians in Jerusalem were having. That church was burgeoned suddenly, uh, and they, they struggled from the get-go to make ends meet. So he went to Philippi, avoiding a plot against him. All this is documented in, in Acts. Gave the letter to Phoebe because he commends Phoebe uh, as a deaconess from the church at Sincrea uh, near Corinth, and she carried it to Rome, and you'll see that in chapter 16. What about the theme and the purpose? Now, we'll differ a little bit from the purpose. He, he said it, the purpose was written to make sure the church was unified. This Paul wrote because he'd never been there. He wanted to come there, and, and thinking he might not make it, he laid out the gospel. He wanted to make sure they were soundly grounded in the gospel. For Paul, this church was too important to get sideswiped by some of the errors, the Gnostic errors, the Judaizer errors that he dealt with wherever he went. If you're familiar with his, his travelings by now, you know 2 Corinthians is going to become obvious. The, he calls them super apostles. These people who, who pitch themselves as apostles, more spiritual than Paul, more authority than Paul. And he, bought, he fought that kind of thing. And so he wants to give an anchor, foothold for the gospel in Rome, make sure it doesn't, it doesn't uh, deviate from that. He wrote to reveal God's sovereign plan of salvation, to show how Jews and Gentiles fit into that plan and to exhort them to live righteous and harmonious lives. If you read through the gospel, through the letter in one city, he goes from condemnation to glorification, from, from positional doctrinal truth to practical truth. What about the keys? Well, the key phrase we entitled this study tonight, the righteousness of God. God's moral perfection, his standard that does not change, but also, as was mentioned on the video, woven into that righteousness is God's faithfulness to keep his promises. God doesn't break his promises. We might, he doesn't. All his promises are yes and amen, so be it. And so his righteousness is, when Martin Luther, we were studying Martin Luther back in October, and someone asked Martin Luther because he was just struggling with the righteous perfections of God that he could never attain it. And someone asked him, about it, he said, well, did you love God? He said, love God, I hated God. What he was talking about was I, there was no way I could be right before God. And then Romans broke in on him. The just shall live by faith. Heaven opened to him, he said. Like he was brought into paradise. The verses, we've already read them, chapters 1, 16, and 17. I won't read them again. Chapter 3, 21 to 25, a very critical passage. And if you, if you read them together and just forget for a moment chapter 1, 18 through chapter 3, 20, you'll see that they're carrying the same thought, the righteousness of God. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith it's anchored in faith, it's for faith, issues forth in faith. The key chapters. Uh, six through eight, in chapter six through eight, you have, you have uh, union with, with God, union with Christ in chapter six. Remaining sin in chapter seven, that's a fascinating chapter if you've not read through that. It's given commentators no, no small amount of perplexity through the years. But basically, Chapter 7 teaches that as Christians, we are delivered from the dominion of sin. We're delivered from the penalty of sin. We're not, we're not delivered from the condition of sin because we're not in heaven yet. This has saved people's sanity who believe they are Christians, who've been saved by grace through faith, and yet who battle remaining sin. And they think that because they battle remaining sin and they haven't, they haven't quote, let go and let God, terrible advice, that, that somehow they're not saved. Paul says, no. The good that I know I should do, I, I leave undone. The things I know I should not do, I find myself doing. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? And if you want to take a loose translation of the Greek he uses there, who will deliver me from this stinking corpse that is tied to my back? That's how he felt about the sin that remained. And he doesn't give a formula, we'll do this, do this, do this. The very next thing he says, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the answer. He's already delivered us. We've been delivered from the dominion. Sin shall not reign over you in Romans. But not the condition. You will battle remaining sin. John Owen, the Puritan, said, if we're not killing sin, sin is killing us. We need to fight it. Take heart. Hack it to death when it manifests itself. But don't let the devil use that. Don't let the devil use that to convince you you're not saved if you're battling sin. Now, if you're raising cobras, <laughs> something's wrong. But if you find one and kill it, that's okay. That's battling sin. And then chapter 8, beautiful chapter. There is now no condemnation. It begins in chapter 8, verse 1. Right after chapter 7, battling sin. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Chapter 8, 1. There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It's important to remember that when you're fighting the fight of faith. And it closes with, and there can be no separation from the love of God. And he talks about what, what could do that. Life, death, things in heaven, things. No, none of it. And all these things, he says, we are more than conquerors. More than conquerors doesn't, doesn't really capture it. We are, there's a preposition used. All these things, we are super conquerors. We don't just conquer, we super conquer. We don't just win, we destroy the enemy through him who loved us. And so in the middle of that, of course, is that beautiful chain of grace what Spurgeon called the golden chain that links together uh, from eternity past into eternity future God's, God's perfect plan to save sinners. And what about seeing Jesus then? Well, I mentioned on the video, and I want to call, Jesus is presented as the second Adam. Think about this. The first Adam failed miserably, placed in the garden. He, he and his, his companion upright, perfect, complete use of their minds. I, I think about that and it just blows me away. Probably you and I don't on our best day use 5% of our minds. You meet someone using 10%, they're the most brilliant person you've ever met in your life. Adam had full use and sin marred all of that. The first Adam. And Adam all die, 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says. In the first Adam. His death, Romans 5, says one man sinned, all considered guilty. You see, Adam, the first Adam, represents the whole human race. There's a, my brother wrote his Ph.D. dissertation on, on, on what's called federal theology. Federal is just is the word for covenant, foitus. Adam represents the whole human race. Everyone born in Adam. Jesus Christ, the second Adam, represents all who will come into him, all who will believe. So the challenge you and I had before we were saved, the challenge anyone has is to get out of Adam and into Christ. And that happens by grace through faith. See, Adam represents his, represents the whole universe of creatures made in the image of God. Jesus represents all those given him by the Father who come to him by grace through faith. You want to be out of Adam in Christ. And if you're in Christ, there's no better place to be. And so he's represented in, in Romans as the second Adam whose righteousness and substitutionary death have provided justification for all who place their faith in him. He offers his righteousness, his perfection. He never sinned. It's a gracious gift to sinful people. He has endured God's condemnation and wrath for the sinfulness of all who will trust in him. His death and resurrection are the basis for the believer's redemption, being bought out of the slave market of sin, justification, being declared not guilty and accepted as righteous in God's sight, only for what Jesus Christ has done and our faith in him. Reconciliation, we were enemies with God. Romans 5, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He reconciles us to God. Glorification. All whom he saved, he will 
present to the Father. The letter to the Romans teaches us these things about Jesus Christ. The willing and able Savior of every sinner, every son of Adam, every daughter of Eve who will trust in him. None will be turned away, he said. Romans gives us the gospel clearly. Well, what about his contributions? And I need to wrap this up now. What, the contributions of Romans to the body of Scripture. It's Paul's longest work. It lays doctrinal foundations. Think how poor we would be concerning the panorama, the universality of sin, the nature of justification by faith, the reality of union and communion with Christ, the, the facing the, the staggering, daunting challenge of remaining sin. Brothers and sisters, I would have gone crazy in my journey earlier had I not been delivered by the teaching of Romans 7. The conquering grace of God in Romans 8. The sovereign election of God in 9, 10, and 11. The call to holiness in 12 and 13. 14, 15, and 16, the understanding of Christian liberty. As we went through 1 Corinthians, there's a section in Romans just like that that deals with the, the things indifferent, making the distinction. We would be so poor were it not for that. Teaching us that Jews and Gentiles both stand guilty before God. I had someone say to me years ago when I was teaching through this, and they were really, they were seriously offended by the idea that everyone stands guilty. And she came to me and she said, I want you to know something. My grandfather paid to have that parking lot out there paved. I said, when you see him, tell him thank you. Well, he's dead. He's going, I was okay. She started telling me all the, there were some plaques this one of these churches had plaques on the pews, you know. And she started pointing out plaques at her. And I said, that's, that's, that's nice. But you know that none of that diminishes your need of Jesus. I had a deacon whose wife worked at the prison down the road. We were talking one about this matter, the universality of sin, that that a person relate, raised in a religious home who's unconverted is, is depraved, just like the, the most depraved person you've ever known. He said, you mean to tell me that, that in God's eyes I'm no better than the, than the people over in uh, that prison in, in East Feliciana Parish that made all these bad things? I said, well, I mean, they may have done some heinous things you haven't done, but in the sight of God we're all sinners condemned until we come to faith in Christ. Well, that's just not fair. I said, well, that's just it. Grace is not about fairness. <laughs> Grace is not about fairness. See, my point I'm making is people, people need this. They don't think in terms of this. They look at other people and imagine that they, that they themselves are better than these other people. Maybe kinder, maybe nicer, maybe more generous, but an unconverted person is as dead in trespasses and, and, and sin and his kindness as the most wicked person that's ever walked the planet is dead in trespass and sin. And Paul teaches us this here. It's a great contribution to that. Romans is the most formal of Paul's writings. It's really, it is a letter to a church, but it's really a gospel treatise. He didn't know many of the people in Rome, and we're not, we don't know the answer to how he knew the people he greeted. We don't have the answer to that. He wasn't trying to refute any errors in the church as he does uh, in the Thessalonians and Corinthians, Colossians. Someone suggested this is primarily a preventative. He was, he was get, laying down a gospel foundation and a corrective epistle. He uses debate format. You will say to me, but I say... And so this is the last thing, and I found this, and I thought this was good. 
the result of Paul's approach to writing the letters of the church at Rome is one of the most forceful, logical, eloquent works ever penned. And one writer suggested that Romans has influenced the subsequent history of the church more than any other epistle, and it's not a stretch to say that it was this letter to the church at Rome that was the flashpoint for the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. And that's a quick overview, you may not think so quick, but a quick overview of the letter to the Romans. Any questions or comments?